Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Today we're going to be resuming our series in 1 John. And we'll be examining chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. So I invite you to open your Bibles to that passage. If you notice, I have a stool behind me in case I feel discomfort. I'll, I'll maybe use that, but we'll see. Before we delve into this passage in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, uh, we're told in Hebrews 4, 12 that your word is living and effective and that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. You tell us that it penetrates as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it's able to judge the thoughts and ideas of our heart. So with that in mind, I pray that as we examine this passage in 1 John 2, that we would allow it to penetrate and judge our hearts so we can apply it to our daily lives and be more conformed to the image of your Son. For Jesus' sake, amen. <laughs> It's very difficult to avoid the lure of the world. It encroaches on us even when we've made a concerted effort to resist its pull. There's a story told of a man who had grown weary of the constant pressure to keep up with the Joneses. And so he decided to get away from it all. So he joined a mute monastery. It was a very demanding commitment. Monks could only say two words every five years. For the first 15 years, monks were on trial. If they were successful in meeting the requirements of the monastery during this 15-year trial period, then they could take final vows. Perfect, the man thought. No phones to ring. No clients to call on. No credit cards to pay off. This is just what I need. So he joined as a novitiate, or someone on trial, and for the first five years he did not say a word. At the end of that time, he was called into his superior's office, where he was told that he could say two words. Bad food, he complained. Thank you, I'll make a note of your observation, his superior said rather stiffly. So the man went back to his duties as a novitiate, and for another five years, did not utter a word. At the end of that time, his superior asked him if he had anything he would like to say in two words. The man replied, hard bed. <laughs> for another five years, he did not say a word. His superior called him in and asked him if he had anything to say and if he were ready to take his final vows. The man stood up and said, I quit. His superior replied, well, I'm not surprised. You've done nothing but complain since you got here. <laughs> you know, even joining a monastery to get away from all temptation does not protect us from the world. Our desire for the world is in our hearts. And the outside temptations only give the opportunity for the heart to reveal itself. If we're going to conquer worldliness... We must do it then from the inside out. Well, today's text in 1 John 2, 15 through 17 addresses the issue of worldliness, stating that we as believers must not love the world. They're different sides of the same coin of Christian faithfulness. Our previous time, if you recall, in 1 John 2, we saw in verses 12 through 14 the need to recognize our spiritual assets as believers in Christ. And this then provides the incentive to heed the command of today's passage, to not love the world. So in verses 15 through 17, we are exhorted to resist the world's allurements. Notice what John writes here. Do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle is not from the Father, but is from the world. 
And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does God's will remains forever. The first reason we are to resist the world's allurements is because of what the world is, as indicated in verse 15. <clears throat> Notice again, John begins by saying, Do not love the things, or do not love the world, or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. The present, the present tense command here to do not love the world can literally be translated, stop loving the world. So this suggests that John's Christian readers were to some extent caught up in loving the world. They were acting in a way that was inconsistent with their relationship with Christ. Now we must be very careful then not to assume that this verse is written for someone else, such as my unbelieving neighbor or my neighbor in church. The truth of the matter is it's quite possible for believers to love the world. And that's why John commands his Christian readers to stop loving the world. Now, once we've made the decision to stop loving the world, we must fight to maintain our choice against the strong current of the world. It's an ongoing battle. The statement that, notice, the love of the Father is not in him, which appears in most translations, love of the Father is not in him, it could theoretically, from reading that, mean the Father's love for that person who loves the world, implying that the Father does not love that person. But there's no reason to take it that way. In chapter 4, verse 4 of his New Testament letter, James warned his Christian readers that whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. So it's better to understand 1 John 2.15 as saying, love for the Father is not in him. Again, when John wrote this letter, he was not referring to the salvation of his readers. He was simply saying that such a believer does not love God. Love for the world will drive out love for God. Thus, it hinders intimate fellowship with God. Love is, you see, capable of only one primary focus. The word world in verse 15 is translated from the Greek, Greek word cosmos, which has the basic meaning of order. And it leads to its two main uses. First, adornment, or decoration, or external adorning. And this, this is the way it's used uh, in the New Testament only in 1 Peter 3.3, 3, where cosmos speaks of the woman wearing that which is fitting with her character as a believer. And it's not incongruous or out of order. In the context of James 4.4, 4, she should not seek external adornment that mimics that of the world. Thus, a believing woman's attire should always be so ordered so as to draw attention to her inner person, characterized by a gentle and quiet spirit, as James writes, rather than outward things, such as elaborate hairstyles or, or clothing, as we're told in 1 Peter 3.4. The, uh, secondly, the word world, as used elsewhere in the New Testament, has a variety of nuances which must be determined by examining the context. For example, John uses cosmos to refer to the people of the world in general in 1 John 2.2, 2, much like in John 3.16. 1 John 2.2 2, it says, He, Jesus, is the propitiation, rotonic sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now, some people claim that Jesus died on the cross only for God's so-called elect, and that the gospel is not for the whole world or for everyone. And this views John 3, 16 to mean that God so loved the elect that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever was unconditionally elected before the foundation of the world should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that's a good example of eisegesis, or reading into uh, Scripture one's own ideas. And it's based on the, the Calvinistic notion of limited atonement. Instead, John 3.16 teaches that God, the greatest source, so loved the greatest heart, the world, the greatest extent that he gave 
the greatest sacrifice, his one and only son, the greatest gift, that whoever the greatest invitation believes in him, the greatest terms should not perish, the greatest deliverance, but the greatest difference have everlasting life, the greatest promise. One of the popular Christian Christmas carols we sing during this Advent season is Joy to the World. Jesus Christ is indeed the Savior of the world without any exception. The Greek word cosmos, translated world, gives us our English word cosmos, uh, the ordered universe. Also, cosmopolitan, which is literally a citizen of the world, and cosmetics, those things we put on in order to bring order out of chaos. A matter of cosmic significance is something which is important for the whole world. When one speaks of a cosmopolitan city, it means a city which has citizens from many parts of the world. Cosmos is the absolute antithesis of chaos, which is a Greek word meaning a rude, unformed mass. Chaos being the fantasized condition from which the theory of evolution begins. The Bible, on the other hand, uses the word cosmos to describe the original condition of the universe, such as used in 2 Peter 3, 6, before the global flood of Noah's day. The original condition of the universe was one of perfection, and it points back to Genesis 1, 31, which says it was very good, particularly before the fall as well, not very chaotic. What is the world which, uh, to which John refers then in 1 John 2, 15? Well, the word world has at least three different meanings. It sometimes means the physical world, the earth. That's how it's used in Acts 17, 24, which speaks of the God who made the world and everything in it. It also means the human world or mankind. That's how it's used in John 3, 16. For God loved the world in this way. Sometimes these two ideas run together as in John 1.10 which says he, meaning Jesus, was in the world and the world, that of nature, was created through him yet the world of mankind did not recognize him. But John's warning do not love the world is not about the world of nature or the world of mankind. As Christians we ought to appreciate the beauty in usefulness of the earth that God made. The early Christian philosopher Augustine, or some, most people call him Augustine, scholars say Augustine, which I don't claim to be a scholar, but <laughs> the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa said, the world is a book and those who do not travel read only one page. In 1 Timothy 6, 17, the Apostle Paul said that God richly provides us with all things to enjoy. And we certainly ought to love people, not only our friends, but even our enemies. The word world, named here in 1 John then as our enemy, is an invisible spiritual system opposed to God and Christ. We use the word world in the sense of system in our daily conversation. The TV announcer says, we bring you news from the world of sports. In fact, several of you may remember a popular TV program that used to air on Saturday afternoons on the ABC network for many years called Wide World of Sports. It was hosted by Jim McKay. The, word, or the, wor the world of sports is not a separate planet or continent. It's an organized, say, organized system made up of a set of ideas, people, activities, purposes, and so on. And the world of finance and the world of politics are likewise systems of their own. Beyond what we see in sports or finance is an invisible system that we cannot see. It's the system that uh, keeps things going. The world in the Bible is Satan's system for opposing the, word, the work of Christ on earth. It's the very opposite of what is godly and wholesome and holy and spiritual. In chapter 5, verse 19, 
of his first letter, John says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. In John 12, 31, Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. And Ephesians 6, 12 indicates that the devil has an organization of evil spirits working with him and influencing the affairs of this dark world. And just as the Holy Spirit uses people to accomplish his God's will on earth, so Satan also has people to fulfill his evil purposes. The first couple of verses of Ephesians 2 indicate that unsaved people, whether they realize it or not, are led by the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient. So unsaved people belong to this world. In Luke 16, 8, Jesus calls them the people of this world. 1 John 3, 1 points out that when Jesus was here on earth, the people of this world did not understand him, nor do, nor do they now understand those of us who trust him. We who are Christians, you see, are members of the human world, and we live in the physical world, but we do not belong to the spiritual world that is Satan's system for opposing God. Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, 19, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. The world, then, is not a natural habitat for the believer. Paul tells us in Philippians 3, 20, that our citizenship as believers is in heaven. And all our effective resources for living on earth come from our Father in heaven. You see, the believer is somewhat like a scuba diver. The water is not man's natural habitat. He's not equipped for life in it or under it. When a scuba diver goes underwater, he has to take special equipment with him so he can breathe. You know, if it were not, if it were not for the Holy Spirit living within us, and the spiritual resources that we have in prayer and Christian fellowship and the Word, we could never make it here on earth either. We hear people complaining about the pollution of Earth's atmosphere. Well, the atmosphere of the world is also polluted spiritually, that Christians cannot breathe normally. Well known author, pastor, and host of Insight for Living radio broadcast, Charles Swindoll, says in his book, Living Above the Level of Mediocrity, the world system is committed to at least four major objectives, which I can summarize in four words, fortune, fame, power, and pleasure. First and foremost, fortune, or money. The world system is driven by money. It feeds on materialism. Second, fame. That's another word for popularity. Fame is the longing to be known, to be somebody in someone else's eyes. Third, power. This is having influence, maintaining control over individuals or groups or companies or whatever. It is the desire to manipulate and maneuver others to do something for one's own benefit. Fourth, pleasure. At its basic level, pleasure has to do with fulfilling one's sensual desires. It's the same mindset that's behind the slogan, if it feels good, do it. But there's a second and more serious reason why we as Christians must not love the world, indicating in verse 16, because of what the world does to us. Notice John writes, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle is not from the Father, but is from the world. Here in, John, uh, here in verse 16, John points out that the world system uses three devices to trap Christians. They are called the lust or desire of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle. It's interesting that these same devices trap Eve back in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 6 says, Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food, or the lust of the flesh, and delightful to look at the lust of the eyes, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom, the pride in one's lifestyle. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. 
Now, the lust of the flesh appeals to our appetites. It includes anything that appeals to our fallen sinful nature. Literally, it refers to unrestrained passion, sinful gratification, seeking to dissatisfy our desires with the things that God forbids. The Apostle Paul describes it this way in Galatians 5, 16 through 21. It says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the Apostle Peter writes in uh, 1 Peter 2.11, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that war against you. The flesh, then, does not mean the body. Rather, it refers, refers to the basic nature of sinful man that makes him blind to spiritual truth. Flesh, you see, is the nature we receive at our physical birth. Spirit is the nature we receive in the second birth. A Christian has both the old nature, or the flesh, and the new nature, the spirit, in his life. And these two natures, as you know from experience, fight quite a battle. You know, God has given us certain desires, and these desires in and themselves are good. Hunger, thirst, weariness, and sex are not evil in themselves. But when the flesh or the old nature controls them, they become sinful lusts. Hunger isn't evil, but gluttony is sinful. Thirst isn't evil, but alcoholism is a sin. Sex is God's precious gift when used rightly, but when you use wrongly, it becomes immorality. You see how the world operates? It appeals to the normal appetites and tempts us to satisfy them in forbidden ways. Well, the second device that the world uses to trap us is called the lust of the eyes. And this refers to unrestrained fantasies, sinful longings, desiring that, what you, desiring that which you see that is un wise or wrong to have. As such, it appeals to our affections. <clears throat> we sometimes forget that the eyes can have an appetite. Have you ever said, for example, feast your eyes on this? The lust of the flesh appeals to lower appetites of the old nature, tempting us to indulge them in sinful ways. However, the lust of the eyes operates in a more refined way. In view, here are pleasures that gratify the sight and the mind. Sophisticated and intellectual pleasures. It's interesting that back in the days of the Apostle John, the Greeks and Romans lived for entertainment and activities that excited the eyes. You know, times haven't changed that much, have they? The writer of Psalm 119 prayed in verse 37, Turn my eyes from looking at what is worthless. You know, in view of many television shows today, as well as the internet, maybe this should be our prayer as well. The third device is the pride in one's lifestyle, which appeals to our ambitions. You know, God's glory is rich and full, but man's glory is vain and empty. In fact, the Greek word for pride was used to describe a braggart who exaggerates what he has in order to appreciate others. It's the I, me, my person. The pride in one's lifestyle speaks of the person who glorifies himself rather than God. You know, we hear, hear that word pride quite a bit today, don't we? Which speaks of a person who glorifies himself, makes an idol of his stuff, his careers, his achievements, or his social standing. 
pride, power, possessions, prestige, and position is what life is all about to these kind of people. This person fails to see that the Lord Jesus, the King of glory, turned the value system of this world and all its stuff on its head. For example, uh, Jesus, Jesus set an example. On pride in birth and rank, he was a carpenter's son, a poor man's child. On pride in possessions, Jesus said, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. On pride in pedigree, it was said, can anything good come from Nazareth? On pride in people he, that he knew, it was said, he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. On pride in intellect, he said, as the Father has taught me, I speak these things. On pride in self-will, he said, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, Father, but yours be done. On pride and possessions, it was said of Jesus, he who knew no sin became our sin, became sin on our behalf in order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's important for us to realize that no Christian becomes worldly all of a sudden. Worldliness creeps up, creeps up on a believer. It's a gradual process. First, there's friendship with the world, as James 4.4 points out. By nature, the world and the Christian are enemies. 1 John 3.13 says, Do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. A Christian who is a friend of the world, you see, is an enemy of God. Next, the Christian becomes polluted by the world, as James 1.27 says. The world leaves its dirty marks on one or two areas of his life. This means that the believer gradually accepts and adopts the ways of the world. When this happens, the world ceases to hate the Christian and starts to love him. So John warns us, do not love the world or stop loving the world. But too often, our friendship with the world leads to love. As a result, the believer come, becomes conformed to the pattern of this world, as Romans 12, 2 says, and you can hardly tell the two apart. Sad to say, being conformed to the world can often lead a Christian into, be, uh, into being condemned with the world, as 1 Corinthians 11:32 indicates. If a believer confesses and judges this sin, God will forgive him. But if he doesn't confess, God will lovingly discipline him. When a Christian is condemned with the world, he does not lose his salvation. Rather, he loses his temporary or testimony and his spiritual youthfulness. And in extreme cases, Christians have even lost their lives. Like physical children, these spiritual children know their father, but they still have some spiritual growing to do. A spiritual Christian shuns worldliness because of what the world is. It's a satanic system that, that hates and opposes Christ. And because of what the world does to us, it attracts us to live on sinful substitutes. He also shuns worldliness because of where the world is going, which verse 17 indicates. Verse 17 says, the world is passing away. You know, friends, this world is not permanent. The only thing sure about this world system is that it's not going to be here forever. One day the system will be gone and the pleasant attractions within it will be gone. What's going to last? Only what is part of the will of God. Spiritual Christians keep themselves loosely attached to this world because they live for something far better. Hebrews 11.32 11.3 says they are aliens and strangers on earth. So John here is contrasting two ways of life. A life lived for eternity and a life lived for time. A worldly person lives for the pleasures of the flesh. But a dedicated Christian lives for the joys of the spirit. A worldly believer lives for what he can see, the lust of the eyes. But a spiritual believer lives for the unseen realities of God. A worldly-minded person lives for the pride of life, the vainglory that appeals to men. But a Christian who does the will of God lives for God's approval. And, as John writes, he lives forever. 
This prospect is open to each and every one of us as humble believers. If you're trusting Christ, it's for you. This present system, this present world system, is not a lasting one, friends. Everything around us is changing, but the things that are eternal never change. A Christian who lives for the world will never have peace or security because he has linked his life with that which is in a state of flux. As the missionary martyr Jim Elliott wrote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The New Testament has quite a bit to say about the will of God. One of the fringe benefits of salvation is the privilege of knowing God's will. In fact, as Colossians 1.9 says, God wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will. The will of God is not something that we consult occasionally like an encyclopedia or a Google search on a computer. It's something that completely controls our lives. The issue for a dedicated Christian isn't simply is it right or wrong or is it good or bad. The key issue is, is it the will of God for me? You know, God wants us to understand his will, not just to know what it is. It's important that we understand God's will for our lives and see the purposes he's fulfilling. After we know the will of God, we should then do it from our hearts. And the more we obey God, the better we are able to find and follow God's will. So how does one discover God's will? Well, the process begins with surrender. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul says, Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Do not conform to the pattern of this world so that you may be able to discern what God's will is. A Christian who loves the world will never be able to know the will of God in this way. The Father shares his secrets with those who obey him. You see, friends, God's will is not a spiritual cafeteria where a Christian picks and chooses only those items he finds appealing to his feelings. The will of God must be adopted in its entirety. This involves a personal surrender to God of one's life. God reveals his will to us primarily through his word. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. A worldly believer, though, has no appetite for the Bible. When he reads it, he gets little or nothing from it. But a spiritual believer who spends time daily reading the Bible and meditating on it finds God's will there and applies it to his everyday life. We may also learn God's will through circumstances. God moves in wonderful ways to open and close doors. But we must test this kind of leading by God's word and not test the Bible by circumstances. Finally, God leads us into his will through prayer and the working of the Spirit in our hearts. You know, as we pray about a decision, the Spirit may guide us by giving a sense of agreement or a similar desire with the leading of circumstances. But we must, also, we must always test this by the Bible because it's possible for our feelings to lead us astray. And we should be aware of anyone who claims that the Lord told me to do such and such, unless they can quote a chapter and verse from the Bible to validate it. You know, God has already spoken to us completely in the completed canon of Scripture that we have and in the person of his Son. So there's no need for extra-biblical revelation today. As Jude 3 says, the faith was delivered to the saints once for all. And as Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 tells us, long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. So friends, if you want God to speak to you regarding his will, read his word. If you want him to speak to you audibly, read it out loud. <laughs> the will of God is everything that God makes known to us by the word and by the Spirit as being his will for our lives. What then are some practical, biblically, based examples of doing the will of God. We well, hear just a few. Uh, they're very clear. For example, finding a spouse without premarital physical involvement. Staying in a difficult marriage when your emotions are screaming at you, at you to run away. 
not being dishonest and unethical in your business, even though it would mean a lot more money in your pocket. Not taking that promotion, which would double your salary, but would also cut your family time in half. Not cheating on the test, even though it would help you get a better grade. Honoring your father and mother, even though their ideas seem so old-fashioned and out to lunch. Giving the gift of love to a child which seem, who seems impossibly difficult. Several years ago, a real Cinderella story, most of you are probably aware of, burst onto the scenes of the NFL. About a man who played quarterback from 1990 to 1993 at a small, obscure college, Northern Iowa University. He spent the following four years without being named to an NFL roster. He was signed by the Green Bay Packers in 1994, but was released before the regular season even began. He needed to find a job and began stocking shelves for $5.50 an hour, which he did for six months at a Hy-Vee grocery store in Cedar Falls, Iowa. From 1995 to 1997, he played in the Arena League with the Iowa Barnstormers. In 1997, he married an abandoned divorcee who was on food stamps. God, however, had something special for him. In December of that year, he signed with the St. Louis Rams and was sent to play for the Amsterdam Admirals of NFL Europe the following spring. He landed his first NFL roster spot in 1998 with the Rams, holding a backup position until he was thrust into becoming St. Louis starter the following season following an injury to veteran quarterback Trent Green. And during his first season as an NFL starting quarterback, he led what has been called the greatest show on turf offense to the Rams' first Super Bowl title, earning him league and Super Bowl MVP honors. His name, as you're well aware, is Kurt Warner, and he's a wonderfully committed Christian. As he commented on his playing days in Europe, he said, as quoted in World Magazine, I really got to know the Lord there because of all the temptations from the devil in Amsterdam. Drugs, women, promiscuity, everywhere you go. The devil tried to get me to fall, but I gave my life completely to the Lord. When asked what he wanted his football epitaph to be, to be he simply said, he used his football platform to work for Jesus. <laughs> you know, friends, the world loves us in order to destroy us and abuse us. Jesus loves us in order to save us and to use us. The world's glory is but for a moment, but God's glory is forever. As John writes, he who does God's will remains forever. To sum up, as Christians, we're in the world physically, but we're not of the world spiritually. Christ has sent us into the world to bear witness of him. Like a scuba diver, we must live in an alien environment, and if we're not careful, the alien element will stifle us. As Christians, we cannot help being in the world, but the, when the world gets in us, trouble starts. As Christians, each of us must decide, will I live for the present day only, or will I do God's will and live forever? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this exhortation from the Apostle John. As he urges us, help us to resist the allurements of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in our lifestyle. Help us, Father, to fill our minds and hearts with your word and to seek to obey you so we might not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ in us so that we can be effective witnesses for Jesus in this world that we live in now. 
Thank you, Father, that in so doing, we realize that uh, we, as we follow you, will, will remain forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.